Welcome back to another happy hour. David, good to see you. Hey, how you doing? Uh, it's doing been a great. busy week. It's March. Uh, real estate market is heating up and uh, got a lot of stuff going on. Absolutely. We're going to make sure uh, I got everything done right here. Let's see. We're going to check, make sure we got a uh, lot of stuff going on. Yeah, we got Absolutely. sound. Absolutely. We're going to make sure. Uh, All right. Let's. Done right here. All right. Uh, we should have you there. There's Cassie. There's Cassie Mingle. Good to see you, Cassie. She's ready to do some uh, condos in Nevada. Is she really? Yeah. Yes, y'all are starting to some. y'all are starting to go out there, right? Yeah, I've got some friends out there in Nevada, so I'm licensed to do loans out there. So if you need a, a second home in in Las Vegas, uh, do some gambling out there. Absolutely. So how, how did it? you how did all that work? Well, I got a friend I went to uh, Zenix Mortgage School with actually a long time ago, uh, back in 2005 or six. Really? Long time ago. And now he's a real estate agent out there, so that's exciting. And is that an expansion of your current business? Or? Yes, yeah. It's, it's so just, Alabama and Vegas, they go hand in hand. For yeah, it. I'm just going to be helping him out with some stuff. Um, and, 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 you know, still Birmingham, Alabama will be the, the focus and the main center of business right Well, of here. course, of course. Yeah. But, hey, who doesn't love a little Vegas? I mean, I, bachelor parties, mortgages, they, they all go hand in hand. write off the trips out there. Oh, so, I think about that. Yeah, business write-off. Can you write off the losses? I don't think so. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I doubt I it. I doubt it. Well, listen, we got a blue moon. We do a uh, Pacific apricot wheat today. <laughs> this should be interesting. I haven't tried to, it yet. I just want to point out this is the Brinks truck <laughs> of koozies. Uh, uh, I busted this out today. Special uh, the orca. The orca. Okay. Well, now, what it's, is an orca? I don't know, but it's it looks busy. I took this thing out this morning, so the beer's been cold all day. Hey, Skip Tyler, good true. to. Hey, by the way, Skip Tyler, good to see you. Uh, hope your dad's doing well. We're thinking about him. Uh, one of my high school teachers. Uh, well, he's he's one of them, but uh, his dad uh, is uh, not doing too well. But one of the great men of uh, the teachers that I had in high school. And That's uh, awesome. Hey, we're thinking hate about hear, you, man. Hate to hear he's not doing well, but uh, but yeah. So what do we got today? We got David Buster's Galleria, huh? Man, can you believe Birmingham's growing up? First, we get Top Golf. Man, I'm telling you, the stuff down downtown around Top Golf and all the restaurants down there is is a lot of fun. I've been down there a couple of times, and uh, it's it's exciting. Well, you're 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 actually uh, a, a aficionado down in there, or whatever you want to say. You're good. You actually know how to play I know the how Top to, Golf game. I know game. how to swing a club. <laughs> it's different from knowing how to play golf. Well, I mean, I know a lot of our friends around the country are laughing at us talking about Dave and Buster's, but like, we don't really have this kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised to see that down at the Galleria, but that's good. It's expensive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's the stuff. But I tell you, the funniest thing I saw yesterday was, you know, uh, our new mayor has bright lights for the idea that he he's he's tweeting uh, Delta Airlines saying, "Come to Birmingham with your hub." I was thinking, yeah, our one runway. That we have is perfect. And we're going to handle that. Yeah, yeah. We'll handle that volume. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. But uh, hey, somebody uh, talking about your beer, David. There you go, Brittany Rich. See, funny thing is, I think uh, Michael Bruno in the office uh, <laughs> sent out an email said that anybody that tunes in gets a free beer. Um, hey. So, so hey, so my the beers on Bruno. It takes. Thank you, Michael. Good man. Uh, good man. Absolutely. Well, uh, you're welcome, Skip. We're thinking about him. Um, the other thing too is is about the uh, pressure. Wa- you know what drives me absolutely bananas, and I may have mentioned it before, but it, it still does. I think that is, happens once a day, though, right? Absolutely. Okay, go ahead. Pressure washing these darn overpasses. You go to Nashville. You go to Atlanta. You go to anywhere. They pressure wash the stinking overpasses and stuff like that. It will. You talk about an easy way to make because we're going to have potholes. Right? I mean, it's going to happen here in Alabama. Yeah. But just throw a little water on the on the overpasses and everything will be all right. And if you haven't noticed it, it's really crazy. Is that but, going to make you feel better if we pressure wash the overpasses? Yes, absolutely. All right, so we need to call the mayor. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, the new mayor that the thought we were mayor, getting Delta. We're going to add add that to the budget. By the way, we, we have Delta. We just don't have their hub. We got it. Right? It's but anyway, happening. man, what a terrible mistake that, that Delta made the other day in Atlanta. I mean, hey, I don't care which side you're on. Hey, just keep your mouth shut. Because i tell you this much. They lost $50 million in tax incentives from running their mouth, you know, about the NRA. Uh, and I'll, I'll be crazy. honest. I didn't hear about it. Yeah, $50 million. Hey, 
when was the last time you got on Southwest or Delta and really wondered, hey, I wonder what their position on anything is? Gun control? Or- I'm like, hey, just fly the plane. Yeah. Just get me there. I yeah. don't care what you do. Yeah. See, obviously, I guess Collier watches a little more news than I do because <laughs> I wasn't aware of this uh, issue with Delta. But I'll tell you, uh, right now, we've, we've got some stuff going on with rates. The average on Freddie Mac's site was 446 now, we have leveled off since February the 15th, finally. Hey, finally. Finally got a little break, so uh, they're not getting any better, but we've kind of we've stopped moving up, which is, which is awesome. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully that'll... Uh, and we're at four and a half, right, roughly? Yeah, yeah roughly about four and a half, depending on how you want to set the loan up. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll take a little pause on that, that increase so people can catch up. What's the, causing it? Well, it's, it's basically the economic growth. I mean, we had in, in 2007, 2008, we had um, basically a collapse almost uh, of the financial system due to do a lot of practices in the mortgage industry. Since then, rates have come down. When rates come down, that puts money back into the consumer's pocket, which increases consumer spending, which gets the economy going, okay? That's what it's supposed to do, and that's what's happening. Now the economy's going, okay, so rates, everything needs to come back to normal a little bit, and those interest rates moving up is one of those things. We knew this was going to happen eventually, Yeah, right? it had to. Yeah, it had to happen. Nobody wants to see it move this fast, uh, but everybody's still, you know, money's still relatively cheap. Well, well, it hadn't moved in 10 years, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, But it anybody, anybody that had 3.5% uh, 18 months ago, 12 months ago, they just can't stand to hear four and a half. What are you saying to people that say, "Hey, I want to. I'm thinking about refinancing. I'm, I'm at four, four and a half. I mean, that's out the window, is it now? Or no? I mean, they're, they they're still. I'm actually talking to somebody right now that wants to refinance, but they want to add on to the house. They want to take some cash out. I think they're at four and a quarter, so it it might make sense for them to to take that much money out to improve the value and 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 make the house what their family needs it to be is a foster family, okay? So they have uh, some foster kids that come through there and right. they need the space to accommodate their family and, and their lifestyle. So that may make a lot of sense for them and may be a great idea. Probably not going to see a lot of refinance activity right now. Where would you need to be right now in your mind if you're on a if you're previously on a 30-year fixed what price or what percentage should be people be thinking? Hey. You know, usually the rule of thumb is probably 1% that you're going to drop in rate. I just don't, we're not going to see a ton of that mm-hmm. out there. So it's going to have to be situations like this. It's going to have to be different uh, goals uh, for your family or for right. you personally that you're looking to to accomplish with the refinance other than just dropping an interest rate because... You know, a lot of the rates are going to be below four and a half. And what are, what are the what's the spread right now between a fifteen and a thirty year? Yeah, it's still typically about three quarters of a point. And that pretty roughly. stays pretty steady all the time. Yeah, right? but you know, we just we tip, you don't see a whole lot of fifteen year fixed. I think that's about on average about ten to fifteen percent of the business. So you just don't see that as much, uh, especially when rates are moving up. Because people anybody, just locking yeah, in, and anybody that has. A lot of people that were on 15-year fixed or 10-year fixed before, they were probably long-term, so they're still in the house where they were wanting to pay it off. So They were uh, wanting to pay it off at yeah. that point. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell us about, you've seen some local banks. Man, man, listen, in this business, in the mortgage business, you know, I hear advertising and I hear stuff, and they always use keywords. They, they get a little tricky with the phrasing, and this one thing just kind of stuck out to me. There's a local bank here in town that was advertising on the radio a savings rate. So you open a savings account, and you get a savings rate of 2.10%. 2.10? That's amazing. Hey, I, I went to Auburn and, and barely made it out of math. Usually, but I know that's 2.10 not right. is the same as 2.1, but 2.10 sounds better, right? So you hear savings and 10%. Absolutely. So it gets the phone to ring. So I think it's... Hey, Heather. I personally think it's deceptive, but... You know, kudos for for their marketing team and and for them getting that out there. It just kind of irks me to uh, for the client to come in not really knowing the whole story. But hey, it's it's probably honest. So I just thought well, no, it was no, funny. Too, well, thought come it was on, funny. You're, but you're a banker. You're held to a higher standard of your numbers knowledge. I mean, really. Yeah, two point ten percent is it sounds funny, but hey, you know they're. Now, hold on, you're saying that they are actually saying the words two point two point ten. Oh. Not 2.1. Um, but, hey, they're getting some free press here on the Real Estate Happy Hour. So good for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Hello, um, Tyler. Somebody named Tyler Young saying hey, hi to Hey, Tyler. How you doing? Thanks for joining in. Corey Smitherman. 
Sandy Howard, man, good to see you, and buddy. Heather Bush, the Lana Bush is Trey better Fave, half. Karen, man, great to see you guys on here. So, I just wanted to point out that just to be aware of those kind of tactics, and I hear this stuff all the time, but this is the information age, right? Absolutely. So, everybody's got information, but do you have the right information? Is it good information? Okay, I want to give you an example right now of Credit Karma. I, you, ever, you ever heard of it? Hey, I use it. Okay, the only reason I'm talking about it today is because I had a client call me this morning. Um, he told me that his Credit Karma score was a 620. He had one 620, another 620, and a 615 or something It's like odd that. for them to be that close. Yeah, and I and I cautioned him. I said, look, I, I still would rather pull it. I pulled a score. The middle score was a 554. Guys, I just want to... I just want you to be aware of those Credit Karma scores. They're a lot different. Do some, do your own research on it. Uh, like I said, the, the information's out there, but they use a different score than the mortgage does. I just hate to see people set up when they when they call me and they're thinking that their credit scores are one thing, and then I pull it, and then they're upset. It's not as it's not. And to be very clear, it's not that they're inaccurate. They're just a different scoring it's model. It's a different scoring model. It might be a little more similar to uh, insurance scores or a car. You know, what a car company might And it'll tell you if you're doing good or bad. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Yeah, I would think, yes, and that's a great point because what I typically would look at a Credit Karma or or any other type of third-party consumer score, okay? That's the big difference. It's a consumer score versus a mortgage score. I would look at the ranges and say, you know what, if you're below 600 to 620 and below on those, there's some stuff to work mm-hmm. with or, or to work on. I would get your a copy of your own report at freecreditreport.com. Absolutely. Deal with the negative items. Deal with the collection. It's not free credit things. report. It's annual credit report. Okay, that's the one. Annual credit report. That's free the credit one. report's going to charge you. That's the one. Um, now from annual. from six twenty six eighty six fifty, you know, up into the six hundred, you're probably doing pretty good. Absolutely. Um, over seven hundred, you're in good shape. Uh, I would still prefer, me personally, <laughs> to have your own report and, and see. But the biggest difference. Hey, Milton. The I biggest difference is uh, one of the things Credit Karma uses is a V three score. Okay, now what is a V? Th- that means nothing to me. A, a V three score is just a little bit different. I didn't I didn't write it all down, but I know a couple of differences. It was it's kind of a, a look back at twenty four months, which could be a little deceptive. And they leave off uh, no, and they leave off collections. All collections, yeah. not just medical. No. Wow. So that could be a big difference in some of these lower scores. All right, uh, Tyler said working in the insurance industry, insurance scores are usually one to fifty. Yeah. And folks always say I have great credit. Oh, they they do in every industry apparently. Yeah. Uh, so so it could be different. So I mean, it's just uh, uh, you know these services are good and they they give you information. They give you a range of what your scores are. Uh, but I, again, I would re- recommend getting a copy of your own. And and I'd be happy to pull it and give you um, some advice on what to do. We've got a great department in our company uh, that handles this. They'll put together a plan for you for free. All you got to do is follow the steps. Well, you know, one thing I will say positive about Credit Karma, and that's, again, it's a actually a very good, if you'll just use it correctly, you want to find out, hey, which credit cards are reporting? Which ones? I'm not worried about the score necessarily. Like, my wife has this Macy's card from, like, right when we got married 16 years ago. I told her to close it, like, 19 times. Yeah. It's still out there. It yeah. drives me bananas, right? We, do we even have a Macy's? I don't think we do. That okay. might be a very important thing, that, right? But, but when she travels to New York, she, she's oh, got she to gotta have it, yeah, right? Yeah, gotta have it. Well, but but my point is, I now know I have it out there, so I need to find out why. And do yeah. I? And then I gotta call somebody like you and say, hey, do I close that because I'm about to get a mortgage? And the answer to you, I would assume, is, hey, let's don't close anything until we get closer to closing the, or actually, till we close. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of factors to the credit, and it depends on where you are in life. What you're looking to do, you, if you're not looking to buy a house in the next couple of years or any time, you're, you're going to act differently. You're going to do things differently. If you're buying a house really soon, then we might need to look at stuff. I think you know buying a car and getting credit cards, there's a little more leeway on the credit. Um, buying a house, it's a little more uh, stringent. So um, it's it, there's a lot of things to it. So uh, you know, credit karma is a good service. It's just don't don't get too. Uh, and but don't don't put too much on that score, and they get upset when you call them. And it's I will say this too about Credit Karma: it it is free, and the, where they're making their money, in case you're wondering, is they're making their money from offering. You'll see their advertisements and things like that for say another credit card or something like that. That's where they're making their money yeah. when you refer a link and that kind of thing. So just use it appropriately, and then call your lender 
whoever. Hey, John McMillan, big corn husker, Nebraska, big red. There you go. Uh, we're te- we'll teach them how to play football one day, right? <laughs> uh, at least we do have, you know, uh, John and I actually have, we don't, like the, we don't like the same team. So that's where we see eye to eye on that. You know, you know which team that is. I don't want to offend anybody out there. Yeah. I just went to Auburn. Yeah, we'll so, leave that out. Uh, <laughs> well, you went to Georgia Tech, so yeah. you don't offend anybody. Yeah, so. Your basketball team offended everybody, right? Not anymore. Oh, they're yeah, out. Yeah, we're done. Did y'all we're win? What did y'all do? We're did y'all win at all? No. Oh. Nope. Nope. Moving on. Hey, moving on. All right. Well, <laughs> well, one thing we wanted to talk about today is uh, uh, the tax benefits of renting your home. You know, obviously, we've been talking for, what is this, uh, episode seven. We haven't really talked about anything but buying and selling. Yes. And one of the things that I, I've uh, respected about you immensely is you got a good financial brain. And you know that there are some benefits from a tax standpoint to renting your home. And uh, one thing is, too, a lot of those folks are getting mortgages with these rates so low. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is it, yeah, you're, you're getting low rates on the properties that you're turning into investment properties that you're renting out to others. Yeah. Absolutely. And we wanted, and one of the biggest things we can start off by saying is that the Trump tax cuts really didn't, uh, they, they actually are still helping, but they didn't take away anything that we've traditionally gotten uh, as a benefit. Because he, he took away a lot of benefits to other areas of, of the tax code. Right. But really, because most folks are going to form an LLC and that kind of thing. So we want to go, go over the different things that kind of uh, prompt you on uh, uh, different deductions that you could take. Mm-hmm. You know, one is obviously management fees. If you, you know, we have a rental management company and one of the best things is, hey, we charge very affordable 10%, but that is deductible to the owner. I mean, they're going to get to take that right off the top line uh, as an expense. Then you got your maintenance, whatever it costs to maintain that house, because hopefully it's income producing. Uh, it's one of the big things there. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would just add to this that I know there's, so I've seen people in the past that, have rental properties and you really need to get with a CPA and talk to them about how to set this up to take advantage of all the tax um, the tax write-offs and the tax benefits because I know there, there's a certain threshold that if you have it just on your personal returns that uh, you don't get all of the write-offs. So putting it in an LLC and things like that is what you need to look into. Absolutely. Even if you're husband and wife, what a lot of people don't realize is that a husband and wife can do a partnership LLC because they're two different people, right? Right. It's not a solo. I mean, you can legitimately do it. So um, advertising, if you have any advertising that you do and you don't have it managed, you want to talk about the advertising. You get utilities, HOA fees. Hey, there's Lori Valentine checked in. Hey, Good to see hey, you. Hey, Lori. I hope you're doing well. Talk to her today. Uh the, pre- the biggest one, really, and this is from my tax attorney days, is depreciation. Yes. They, it's government mandated. I mean, the, the government says you must depreciate. Well, you don't have to, but when they, they're going to recapture all that at the end. So that's another reason to talk to your CPA. I saw people that would say, I don't want to take it. Well, the depreciation is what usually takes you from a positive number to a negative number in the current year because you're taking it over 27 and a half. You divide the, essentially the value, you divide it by 27 and a half years, and you take that amount. And I'll Every tell you, year. the depreciation is one of the biggest numbers that we add back to your income. When we're calculating income on those rental properties, just for, for your information, depreciation is typically one of the biggest numbers we add back. So you're definitely, mo- it's, it's a definitely, definitely a plus to <laughs> have that. <laughs> yeah, you're adding it back because it really is the government monkeying with the, the numbers. I mean, yeah. uh, there's that. Travel, obviously, if you're going out to work on it. Hey, Mark hey, Carlisle. Mark Carlisle. Uh, interest. Interest, you take a loan out. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's the beauty of it, right? And and really, in this case, you form an LLC. That interest is still going to be deductible. Yeah. Trump didn't mess with that at all. It's an expense of the of uh, this is not just a second home anymore, right? And that's because yeah. we talked about a few weeks ago. Trump's tax code basically says seven hundred fifty thousand dollars cap all the way around of any mortgages. That's not applicable related to this, especially if you have it separated, like we talked about, right? Insurance, uh, the premiums that you take out for any hey, Ray insurance. Williams. Uh, you know, the insurance obviously would be deductible. Legal and professional services. Hopefully you don't need a legal, right? So do they, they pay you twice for the legal and the professional? Yeah, yeah. Well, do they go hand in hand? Because you're a lawyer? I don't know. That's right. No, was a lawyer, retired. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the other things is talking about the uh, passive loss rules. Uh, there's certain things with that if you're a, uh, a real estate professional. I, I, you know, I'm sure uh, whether you're a mortgage guy or not, but uh, you can generally deduct 
$25,000 of these losses in a year unless you're a real estate professional. Then you can take it up from there. Uh, and then there's some caps on that too based on your income. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we talked about passive law rules. The other thing is too, if you have raw land, you can't depreciate raw land. Just like you can't do a lot of things with raw land, right? Right. I mean, uh, that's why you know you guys don't put a lot of stock in the land value of stuff. Yeah. And why is that? Just while we're here, uh, because it's it's uh, you know the value of land is going to obviously depend on where it's located. I mean, if you've got uh, you, you know out in the country, unincorporated county, then uh, it's not going to be as valuable as the city of Mountain Brook. Yeah, so, yeah, so true. Uh, obviously, it's going to go into the value hey, of, of the property, but but we don't do much. Well, I don't do any lending on land, so um, yeah, because it's, it's but it typically it adds to the property value. Well, I did want to mention the um, you know the the flippers, you know, yep. buy investment property. Yep. Because I've got a problem right now on a uh, on a loan we're working on, and, it, and it's falling into the ninety day flip rule in FHA. So <laughs> if you're have owned the property for less than 90 days and there's there's percentages there on how much you resell it for like over a hundred percent then we cannot have that contract dated within when you, 90 days let me ask you a question on that when you say a hundred percent are you saying a hundred percent profit or are you saying a hundred percent a hundred percent over what you paid for so it, if so. i paid a hundred and i'm selling it for 200 yeah yeah and it's 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 a 90 day fha flipping rule and you need to know that because these sellers obviously weren't aware of it they took the contract, and now we're having to to hold on a couple more days, and then you know. And you really have to redate around. the contract, right? Because yes. the contract can't even be submitted to you. Yeah. Now we used to have to start the whole process over. Oh, you don't anymore. No, no. Now we just redate the contract and get a second appraisal. So it's just some things. I mean, you know, when you get into a business like that, it's good to know. Obviously, every time. Absolutely. We, this is a learning uh, learning experience for us on the Facebook Live. Might be a learning experience for these guys buying investment I, property and flipping them. But absolutely. And by the way, if you, I'm gonna put a link down here where you can pick up this handout that we have uh, for you. I'll put it down below uh, yes. after we get off here. The other thing I want to talk about too is you know yeah, Wes Wildman. Uh, How hey, you doing, Wes. buddy? Uh, we were talking about, somebody asked me the other day, who are the wealthiest of our investors? And you know, it's funny, it was an interesting question because we have a lot of folks flipping, yes. and then we have folks that buy and hold to rent, right? By far, the ones that have the most current revenue, obviously, are the flippers. They have these large bank accounts that have things, but that, that bank account's ebbing and flowing as they're throwing money out, right? The wealthiest, because we're talking wealth, is those buy and hold, Long term, let somebody else pay down right. the house. Yeah. They're going to be left with a ton of stuff. And this is not yeah, the stuff. You're really building the equity, right? Absolutely. You're building equity, even if it's your money, right? right. It's like you self funded, and then they're paying you right back for it. Yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a buying a stock that's guaranteed to, to go up. I mean, you know, real estate, obviously, it has its ups and downs, but it is worth more than it was. 20 years ago, and right? And what do you think the reason is between these guys? It's a different mindset, really. Oh, it? it really is. It, it's it's really a different mindset. Hey, I've, Ruby. I've had some, uh, there's some people that had success, you know, even in the stock market, yep. you know, buying and selling. Um, but the buy and hold strategy for most people is going to create more wealth than trying to time the market. That's a difficult thing to do. Timing and is I, and tough. I think you, you're doing the same thing with real estate, but, you know, real estate is actually, you know, uh, a, a little more of a tangible asset. Well, you know, one thing I'll tell you, a lot of folks ask us too, where is everybody buying in our area that I think there's a lot of value? And that would be Alabaster. Okay. Uh, Alabaster is is one of those areas that has a very forward-thinking government, bringing tons of business in there, offering tons of tax incentives. And what ends up happening is we're now seeing prices start to rise because, you know, as you know, a lot of our area had already priced in all these increases over the years. They were, man, can you imagine 30 years ago, that was way down the interstate. Yeah. Now it's really gotten to be a direct suburb of Birmingham. Yes. As evidenced by the traffic uh, with all the shopping centers and all that. Yeah, but, they got some great schools. And uh, good value. The yeah. newest school, right? What yeah. is it? I forgot how many millions of dollars. 80 million, something like that. They yeah. Spent on that school. yeah. So, I mean, that's obviously a booming area. Absolutely. So there's going to be value. Anytime you get into an area like that that's, uh, that's growing, you're going to make money on real estate. Yeah, and you, you financed a few down there for, uh, you know, uh, we have a, a, a tall guy who wears a bow tie, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, he, he's bought a few with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, not trying to That's mention awesome. any names out here, although he would. Uh, yeah. 
I just don't want to out him for being a bow tie wearer, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway, I know we want to kind of walk you through also the process, right? Yeah, we want to talk about the process. Uh, a lot of people are wondering how to get started on buying a house, what to do. Um, this is going to be, you know, really a lot of first-time home buyers, but anybody really now should look more into this before hey, they Kyra. jump out there. Hey, Kyra Craft. Before they jump out there and, and jump in a car with a real estate agent looking at houses, you know, getting pre-qualified and analyzing what the terms of the mortgage are going to be, how they affect your financial goals, uh, looking at credit, down payment, closing costs, uh, things like that is really important nowadays to do to get that out of the way first before you get in a car you can and go out there. houses. Why yeah. would you? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense if you don't know what it's going to cost or or how it's going to affect you. Um, how much money do you want to put down? Do you have enough in retirement savings? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that situation. It's a big financial decision. So why wouldn't you spend a little more time up front getting pre-qualified or pre-approved and going through, you know, some conversations with a lender um, to say, you know, what's this going to look like for me and my family? Well, David, but, but David, I don't want you to pull my credit because you're going to kill my credit. Man, yes. I, and, and that's funny. I had that conversation with that guy this morning that had his credit karma score. <laughs> and I said, man, Here it comes. we have got to look at it. And and like I, I mean, I knew that it was going to be right. off a little bit, and it was it was way off. So when you say way of off, things. where were we? Give us a range. Now his how, the, yeah. now his credit karma score was six twenty. The one I pulled was a five fifty four. <laughs> That's way well, off. Well, yeah. Let's be real. That's he, way off. He did not know. No, he had no idea. He was going off his credit. Karma you at five fifty, you know something. You should. You should, but here's the deal. You know, even looking at credit, there can be hey, differences if, if if you have other financial goals down the road. Maybe you have you have kids going to college in ten years or so and you'd rather put yeah. some money aside for that instead of putting the twenty percent down. Uh, money is still cheap right now. So let's think about that. And those kind of situations where you've got five, ten, less right. than twenty percent down can really be affected by credit score. So maybe we've got three to six months to look at your credit profile and get those scores higher to save you some money. So go ahead and do that up front. I know people always cringe about getting their credit pulled, but you know, it's you're, just you, you just have to have it. It's just a vital piece of information. Am I, am I wrong when I tell folks, if you're worried about getting your credit pulled, maybe you shouldn't be doing whatever you're about to do? Well, that it's possible. You know what I mean? It's possible. Uh, now, I, I, but I've seen people on both, in, both ends of the spectrum, some that have really poor credit that don't want their credit poor, and some that have great credit Thanks, Tom. and don't want their credit pulled. Hey, Tom. Um, One of the so, great appraisers in our yes, area. Yes, yes. Most so, knowledgeable, for sure. Yeah, so I would just say that it's just a big piece for us to get started um, because it's hard for me to give you a set of numbers. Uh, and I'm assuming that maybe you've got a 750 or 760 credit score, and then it comes in at 710. So the, There's a big difference, right? Because seven ten yeah. to seven fifty is we're all going to be upset at you know we the realtor, the realtor, the lender, you. We've all put in this time up front, and now we're all going out into the real estate world looking for a house based on these assumptions. And then we come back, and we and we're fifty points less, and then we're all <laughs> upset. And then then we're going to take some time to get over that. So it's just it just makes the process a little more difficult. I got a solution to all this. Pay your bills on time every month. But that's true. Things happen. And don't co-sign loans if you don't definitely have to. I've seen that burn people more times than not. Things happen. But after we get through that, then we go look at houses. We find an excellent real estate agent like Collier Swecker and the Mega Team. That's right. Then uh, we go look at houses, right? Absolutely. Any And there's so many good agents uh, in our area and around the country. Uh, and we go look at houses. But one of the biggest things that getting that pre-qualification does is it allows us to have an idea, a game plan, so that we are all on the same page. Look, there's nothing more than I want than to get you the most expensive house that you can possibly get. But that's not doing you a service, and it's not doing anything good because you're not going to be able to get it if it's above your price point. So knowing that information yes. really helps the process and streams lines. And I'll um, tell you another thing is is having that letter and having those finances in order right now in this market with, with the competitive offers and and, uh, and people. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's what it so, is now. So many buyers after these houses, man. You've got to have your finances well, in he, order. Here's the thing, David. I'm, I'm leaving here in about, oh, uh, what, another half hour 40 minutes and i'm going to be headed downtown in crestline park 
The House already has two offers. They're taking all the offers tomorrow. But already has two offers. Already yeah, has two yeah, offers. Yeah. I mean, Man, it's I've seen, crazy. I've seen on Facebook, I've seen realtors posting, hey, I've got clients that are looking for this. If you have anything coming up, because people are waiting on this stuff. And soon, so as soon as they come on the market, they're gone. But if I don't have a, one of the reasons I mentioned that is that if my client doesn't have, we already have pre-approval letter and yeah. stuff that's already in my possession that I'm going to be ready to send over with that offer because my hope is that the folks with a competing offer that's close to mine don't have that information right and away. How, and how do you how do you love those people that go see the house and they're like, let me let me think about it. I'll call you tomorrow. Oh no, yeah, bye. Yeah, bye. That's not happening. That's not happening. Bye, Felicia. This <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jennifer. Well, what? So what's next is we write a contract. Write right? the contract. So we got a house now. Look, I've had I've had a plenty of people contact me and and want to do this on their own. And let me tell you, I, I really try to discourage that. There are so many uh, caveats to that real estate contract, and so many things in this process. You got to have somebody on your side, especially lawyers. I mean, I am one technically, but they're the worst because oh, well, I'm a lawyer. I I know exactly how to write. They don't understand local custom, how the mortgage companies want to see it. There's a certain rhyme and reason to why we have Man, a lot of it standardized. There's just things in there. There's issues with title, hey. attorneys, uh, home warranties, uh, surveys, um, uh, just all kinds of things that people disclose inspections Absolutely. that have to happen that real estate agents are used to dealing with. Uh, it's just Prisman. it's just tough. Everybody's favorite criminal lawyer in, in Mobile's back, there Josh you go. Prisman. There he is. Beats, good to see you. But yes, so buyers will rely heavily on your realtor uh, to understand, and negotiate all the aspects of the contract, and this is this is the piece where you you kind of go back and forth with the seller and agree upon a price and agree Absolutely. upon all of these little details to make sure that everybody knows who's handling what. And the other thing I would say is relative to the mortgage piece, uh, he says I'm back. Um, relative to the mortgage piece, is there are certain ways that the mortgage company wants things written. For instance, Tony uh, Webster, how you doing, buddy? the other day we had written in patio furniture. I get a call on Monday from the from the lender going, "Hey, can't have that in there." Right. So that's another thing, and, and there's a slew of things throughout a contract that need to be written so that we can get through underwriting. Correct? Yes. Yeah, and and a real estate agent is going to know that, and they're going to work closely with that mortgage lender that you've already talked to prior to going to look at the house. So that relationship is important for those people, for everybody involved to work together and make sure that the buyer's covered. Everybody's working for the buyer, right? The mortgage lender, the realtor, we're all working for the buyer. So we want to uh, make the sure seller isn't working for the buyer, I guarantee the seller's you that. Not, but, but on the buyer's side- It's gotta be a win-win. Yeah, we're, on the buyer's side, we're all working for you guys. We, we're, we're in the business every day. You guys are not. And so we, we try to put our experience out there so it benefits you. Well, and I, I think I think the other thing too is making sure when when you're choosing that lender, do they understand? Because a lot of times I think that you need a lender that you know is listening to you, right? You and I talked about before we got on here about some of these lenders that aren't listening. For instance, have a client that didn't that wanted to put just the husband on the mortgage because that's all that's needed. He's the one with the primary job, whatever, and the lender's like, eh, I don't like that. Well, it's who are you working for, right? You said it earlier. You're working for the buyer. If if you don't feel like you're being heard, I think maybe you, it is a team. Go to that lender that you feel is yeah. hearing you. Yeah, and and you know one of our jobs is really to figure out your situation and make it work. Uh, there are plenty of people that have great credit scores and twenty percent down, and it's going <laughs> to be a piece of cake. But there's a lot of situations that are tough. Self-employed, low down payments. Self-employed, uh, yeah. Different types of income. I mean, there's a lot of situations, uh, things with the property, uh, things that are in the contract that, that weren't explained correctly. I mean, there's just a lot of situations where somebody experienced in the business can help out and make it easier. Absolutely. And then finally, once you have it, when you talk about underwriting, what is that meaning when it goes through final underwriting? Because we yeah. hear it all the time. Well, um, I did want to add a little piece. We've got the home inspection appraisal and all that stuff that we do after we get the contract. That, that, that where the buyer uh, analyzes the property and learns more about it. But then once we go into underwriting, we, we 
basically take all the information that we gather from you. I know you guys feel like we're asking you for everything. Hey, Courtney. Courtney, how you doing? Um, <laughs> you feel like we're asking you for a, a million things, but we put everything together. We put it into underwriting hey, Mark. and get everything cleared up. Hey, Mark, Mark, this, Mark Wood, he is on his way home. He, he, he's our guy that watches on his way commute back yes. and forth. Yes. So uh, watch out for that car in front of you. <laughs> mm. Don't 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 let them hit the brakes on you. So that's what happens. We get everything cleared up. If underwriting has any questions, they come back to us. We bring to you. Um, pretty simple process. Then our funds get wired to closing. Always wired, right? A lot of wires happening right now, which is probably a topic for another day. But yeah. Um, yeah. a lot of funds getting wired right now. Um, and then all parties get together and we sign sign documents and and change keys and do all that good stuff. Hey, you got you got uh, a question. Okay, so how much does a buyer need to put down for a conventional loan? I know it's not 20% anymore, but a lot of buyers still think that. Right now, we're looking, we've got first time home buyers have some options at 3%. Uh, we do have an That's Alabama. That's not FHA, though, right? Right, we do have an Alabama bond loan that is 100% uh, financing, even though I don't love it for different reasons. That, is it um, expensive? It is a little bit expensive, but it, in certain situations, it works. But outside of that 3% down, Fannie Mae, for first-time home buyers, we also have a th another three percent down program that, uh, depending on your situation in the area, sometimes they have income limitations. Outside of that, it's five percent. So yeah, the twenty percent is really misunderstood. A lot of people think you have to get there. Five percent is really common. I what, think there's there's a just a large percentage of loans that are less than ten percent down. And, and one surprised. thing you may not know is, I mean, the first loan you you did for me years ago, I think was a ninety-three or ninety-two. It was some odd number. Yes, yeah, well, that was a different, yeah, we were doing a different. Is that different? That's no longer around? We don't, we don't use that as much anymore. Okay. Um, but it was, it was a great product then. What about the idea, you talk about these first-time home buyers. What if a spouse, somebody recently married, but one of the spouses had gotten a house before and one of them hasn't? Can they still yeah. avail themselves? Yeah, as long as we have one first-time home buyer, then we, we would look at that uh, Fannie Mae 3% down program. That's, That's a, a good question. Courtney, good do you question. have any questions? Good question, Mark. Do you, we got to get yeah, Courtney to ask Courtney a question. might have a yeah. question for us. Raise your hand, Courtney. We probably need to ask her some questions. Huh? We do. But, yeah, I mean, uh, I would just just go back to, uh, you know, if you guys have any questions on this process, it's just really important now to, to get the information up front and know what you're getting into. Yeah, and now how, how soon before are we expected nowadays with the, dis the, the disclosure rules? Are they still three days we have to disclose and before closing? Or what are the disclosure rules generally? Yes. Now, once we take an application, we have to get that disclosure out, and that's the whole application disclosure out within three days of that application date, and then our closing disclosure, which are the basically the final numbers, those have to go out three days prior. Um, what does that mean when you say go out? Do they just have to look at them, or do they have to sign something? Yeah, we typically send that out a lot sooner, um, and there are changes to third-party fees that are allowable. Right. Um, you, you know closer to closing within the last couple of days. But we try to get those out well in advance. Um, but that's just a, basically the the breakdown of the, the cost associated with doing the loan. And and can a buyer waive that waiting period if they want no, to go ahead and close? No. Now, why do that. is that? Why is it? That makes no sense to me. I know it's not you. and I know it's the federal government. But because, why? Because they don't want to have anybody come back and say that there was some other reason why I waived my rights. I mean, it's got to happen every time they want to keep it. They want to make sure that that buyer knows what they're getting into because there's no right of rescission on a purchase. On a refinance, you got three days to think about it. After you sign, you can cancel. On a purchase, <laughs> it's done. You own it. Yeah, it's done. So you Congratulations. can go back to it. So, so they want. They're not going to waive that that right to the three day rule. And what about as we go as, as you're going through there? What about the idea on these VA and FHA inspections? How does that factor into the mortgage process? Because they're getting more and more strict, right? Well, the the VA the inspection piece of a VA FHA really is just rolled into mm -hmm. the appraisal. So the appraiser is going to look at certain things a little bit harder uh, on a VA or FHA um, on a, appraisal. So there's going to be some things, safety, uh, health and stand, safety issues like that. Yeah, Broken peeling glass, paint. Uh, exposed electrical, peeling paint, um, obvious stuff like that. So that's why you'll see on some houses that don't allow VA or FHA financing is because maybe because of the condition of the property. And, you know, if, if we're buying, one of the things we came up with is a, out of the blue the other day was a 
uh, lender that came back and said we needed a, they were buying a foreclosure. And usually it's not hard to buy a foreclosure. But they came wanting a redemption bond. Hey, Judy, the pride of Enterprise, Alabama. Judy one of the, Fleming. One and of Taylor the best Lloyd. realtors down there. Hey, All Judy. All right. Good to see you, Taylor. Uh, hey, but talk about a redemption bond. When is that needed? Yeah, a redemption bond is needed on a foreclosure. We don't see those much anymore. We saw them a lot uh, in years past. Who pays for that? The seller or the buyer? Man, in your mind? that's a... Negotiable item, but... Who do you think should pay for it's it? It's a negotiable item, but it should be the seller. The seller knows if they're still on the right of redemption. So if anybody gets offended, I'm sorry. But these are the kinds of things that drive me crazy. You know if if you need a right of redemption on the property. It's kind of like selling a car with no brakes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know it doesn't have brakes. I think it's a seller cost all the way. Because here's the, here's the reason I think the seller should pay for it. Is that the seller is the one reaping the benefit of the foreclosure. They got it at a low price. I'm not saying they shouldn't make a huge profit. Not that at all. But well, they're getting the benefit of that, and the buyer an isn't a part of that. It's an expense. Uh, and, the, and the buyer is the one still at risk. There you go. The seller is not. Uh, Courtney's talking about uh, when the loan amount is higher than the yes. amount at yes. foreclosure. Yes, when the loan amount is higher than the foreclosed amount. Okay. Yeah, yes. and the banks oftentimes, yeah. they, what they're buying at foreclosure, they're buying them... So, for crazy numbers. Yeah, so basically the foreclosure amount, so if, if you foreclose on me for $200,000, then I'm going to have to bring $200,000 plus fees and expenses back to redeem the property. So you foreclosed on me for two hundred. You're going to go buy the house at one fifty. So when I bring yeah. the money back, I'm covering you, so you don't need a redemption bond. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Because sure. the, the amount of money I'm bringing back to redeem the property is more than you paid for it. Gotcha. So hopefully that... And, 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 and one of the best things is a lot of this, hey, Ian, um, a lot of this has changed for new loans that were originated after, what, the beginning of 2016 or 2017. They just haven't had time to foreclose yet. Right, right. right. And, and, you know, we just, we, and, and the value or the, or the uh, quality of the loans right now is, is, is a lot higher than it was back then when we saw that glut of For the no, Yeah, the no doc. Oh, I made 800000 Yeah, the ninja loans. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what an awesome loan. I mean, <laughs> let me ask you a question. Who thought it was a good idea just to go, hey, uh, what do you make? I don't care. You know, yeah. we're not going to check. If we, uh, if we put $70,000 a year on the application, crazy. it works. You want to go with that? Yes. Yeah, sure. Why not? I, I don't want to pay fees either. Give me an approval. Let's do it. Done and done. Um, what do we got? All right. So, wanted to kind of talk about livability.com. Okay. Named Birmingham and Huntsville together, which I don't know how we're together because there's not much. I mean, we never go to the other city, but they named us uh, one of the number two on their list of up and coming tech cities. Oh, that's good. It's crazy for Birmingham. I mean, that was never, I think, the Innovation Depot, uh, which is our uh, local business incubator, has helped with that. Having UAB and having, um, I think it's all these new. I think it's all these new business professionals on Facebook Live that's really yeah. driving that technological advancement here in Birmingham. Well, and I think, of course, the local uh, yeah. micro brews and the Brinks uh, truck. Yes, all right. Uh, I got the Brinks truck of koozies here, <laughs> so you don't know what I'm drinking. Well, anyway, the uh, yeah, I wonder what it is. <laughs> um, Omaha, Nebraska was one. Uh, so, John McMillan, if you're still watching, y'all were number one. Isn't that uh, Warren Buffett's hometown? Warren Buffett? The, man, you talk about one of the best places to invest in real estate. That really is. They have schools. They have everything from industry. Go to, figure. Yeah. No, who Warren knew? Buffett's backyard. Best place to invest. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know the other thing I keep thinking That's about? news. It. Every time That's I'm driving news. Every time I'm driving through... Uh, a drive through you know, because I, I thought you were going to say Omaha. I like, no, wow, I think how about, often you drive hey, to Omaha? how old is that man? <laughs> that man's old as dirt. And I was watching something on the other day. He goes every day to McDonald's. Yeah. How's that work? I mean, hey, everybody's been fooling me. The Big Mac uh, is the key. But anyway, Des Moines, Iowa, and St. Hey, Louis Judy. were all, all set there. Stephanie Edge. Um, good to see you guys. You know, we need to support the. I tell you, where Birmingham's getting this wrong, though, it's all about small business. It's not the big business. I mean, we, we had that cockamamie idea that Amazon was going to relocate to Birmingham. Now, I'm not being down on Birmingham, but I'm just telling you, we didn't have a prayer's hope of getting it. I do it. like cockamamie ideas. Absolutely. Though. But what's, those are fun. But what you think about when you think about Birmingham, you think about Avondale Brewery. You think about all these these places. Well, you think places. about uptown, that, that area around the BJCC right now. That's small really, businesses. That's really growing and. and 
that's attracting. I mean, name people. another city that's had this many American idols. <laughs> you ah. can't name one. <laughs> no. I mean, Diana DeGarmo. You got a question here. There we go, Corey. With the talk, here we go. Talk mm -hmm. of tariffs being placed on foreign imports to the U.S. in that's a trade good. war. Could that have any bearing on mortgage backed securities in the market and co? And could it, what? Let's see here. Let's see here if I can see it. And could it have any impact on interest rates? Well, oh, that's a good question. here's the biggest thing I think about the potential trade war. I think a potential trade war is going to be negative. And I think that uh, a lot of investors are going to get concerned and potentially pull money out of the market. I think you've already seen it in some steel, uh, steel stocks Absolutely. that have gotten hit. But I think they're not so much worried about the business of steel. They're worried about more the, the commodity that comes the, out of it. Well, they're they're worried about more of the effects overall to the United States. So I think how that affects us overall is what investors are going to be because I mean, if you get everybody else against us, right? That's going to affect more than steel prices. Mm -hmm. If everybody's mad at the United States for doing this, then it's going to affect more than steel prices. Then they're going to start doing stuff. So it's going to ripple out to other areas. And I think yes, it's going to have a negative effect on the stock market. And I think you know, but that should drive. But but that should drive rates lower. In, probably will in drive the mortgage. rates down. Negative stuff is going to probably push rates back down. U.S. Steel could open back up. Yeah, I saw that too. Better get ready to sell some houses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I mean, that's a benefit. What we're talking about is that, and it's quite funny. Good right? question, Corey. It, Thank you, buddy. It's quite funny that over the years, everybody know, that knows, we, you know, we've advertised with Glenn Beck for a lot of years, right? And, and our best listenership was always in the worst of times, right? Right. And one of the reasons is is that our industry tends to do better sometimes in times opposite. Now, the growth in, in terms of house growth, all that, but interest rates staying low, oftentimes it's when everything's going good that they go up. And when they go bad, interest rates go bad. Yes. In terms for the bank, they go, go good yeah, for the consumer. Go, yeah, yes, exactly right. And then it'll be interesting to see how that stuff affects hey, Christina. The, the psyche of the consumer, because right now the consumer outlook Hope Nashville was fun. Um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, U.S. Steel, I mean, it, it, the other thing, too, is it's going to be very localized. See, here's the thing, the way I look at it, too, is that you're going to have a lot of people in steel country, right? They go, it's booming, it's great, the economy's back, and it's just like if it were coal, right? Everybody in West Virginia would be going, hey, this is phenomenal. Yeah, now, if it works out the way Donald Trump wants it to work out, then it's going to be a boom. It's going to be a boom for everybody. It's going to be huge. It's going to be huge, yes. It's going to be massive. Yes, hey, I'm John I'm the best Donner. ever, right? Thanks for checking in, buddy. Um, but, you know, I mean, you talk about, like, Pittsburgh and country. Here's the thing, what people don't understand. Is Steel that, Town. Pittsburgh Steelers. Hey, the Steelers. Steel Town. They're not just. Hey, Nick. Uh, big Kentucky fan. He's very sad this year. Uh, but talk about Pittsburgh, Birmingham. We're not relying on these industries anymore. And that's one thing that I think Trump has missed in this, is that he's living in a 1950s era in his head of all this industry is going to, just be right back, but there's too much technology and everything's changed. And of course, I, you know, I, I am a Trump supporter. Everybody knows me, knows that. But, but in this case, I think he's living in a different era uh, with a lot more automation uh, and a lot more innovation, right? Yeah, I think just from what I've seen of that, I, th I think he's just trying to, to even even the the standards that that other countries trade with us on. Um, and, and that's where he's where he's going with most of this. So hopefully it's going to translate into more jobs here and in a better uh, a better trade environment, not I, a trade war. And, and you know one thing I think we're seeing now too in the economy relative to to all this is that interest rates relative. See that's the thing. Everybody thinks it all is real estate related, but most of what we're the movement in interest rates has nothing to do with real estate. It has to do with the movement of money. Right. Yes. And, and we we tend to think that it, oh well the market's booming therefore interest rates will go up and they're not going up because of of mar real estate market forces they're going up because of financial forces right right exactly and yeah. and I want to remind everybody too uh, and you can talk about it just real briefly is that when we hear Janet well it's not Janet Yellen anymore I haven't gotten used to the new guy I don't I forget his name the head of the Fed yes. When he says interest rates are going to move, or they move up a quarter of a point, that is not a direct correlation to the mortgage market. 
Right. That's just kind of it's, it's kind of like t- turning the Titanic. So that's like a that's like a little turn. Hadn't turned all the way around, but it's a it's a little movement back in the other direction when when the Fed raises those their uh, Fed funds rate by a quarter of a point. Now that will eventually trickle in. They are in the same family, is what I say. Like the Fed fund rate and mortgage interest rates are in the same family, but you got to think this is an overnight lending rate versus 30-year mortgage rates. So uh, they're not directly correlated, but they do work together eventually. So when those Fed fund rates move up, so do credit card rates and other consumer loan rates, and then obviously in turn, what you're seeing right now is mortgage rates are moving up. But we've had the Fed fund rate moving. And it's a lagging indicator. I mean, it lags way behind. So we've had the Fed fund rate moving for 12 months or so. And now we're just now seeing a a sustained move in mortgage rates. And one thing you'll see in the market, and this is the same with the stock market. It's kind of like when I try to time the stock market. It's crazy, right? Man, just wait for me to try to time it (laughs) and get on the other side. uh, That's true. That that is so true. Yes. Uh, Yes. But you do have some great picks. I'm the champion of calling... The wrong side. Well, you have great picks that come true either six months ago or my six months after. My picks are the best. If my money's <laughs> not in it, they're good. Yeah, but you had the but idea. if my money's in it, they lose. Anyway, well, I know we're going to wrap up here. Uh, one thing to tell you, hey, if you know anybody looking for a job, we are growing and we need a uh, new executive ass- uh, assistant working with us. Okay. Uh, and if anybody knows anybody, I'm going to put a link down below. If you know anybody that's really good and wants to have a awesome... Jerome Powell, head of the Fed. There he is. Uh, Thanks, Nick. Let us know. Hey, Rain, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Um, sorry, sorry you're catching us at the end, Rain, but thank you for checking in. Rain's always and, and here. Benji Wilson as well. Well, good to see you. Uh, Rain's the strongest person on here. But I you think. guys, you guys, uh, leave us some some questions. Any information that y'all have, topics you want for next week or in the future, let us know what they are. Absolutely. Leave us some comments. All right, guys, we will see you next Thursday at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. I was going to say 8, but it's 4. Yeah. All right. Happy hour. All right. Happy hour is over. See you later. Bye-bye.